Yes, uh, Dr. Sanjay. Yeah, I was reading 2.1, Dryden as a critic and the subsequent sections and the subsections given on this web page. Right, right. And uh, I am struck with several doubts. Mm -hmm. uh, say, for example, uh, why Dr. Samuel Johnson uh, called him the father of English criticism. Okay. Hmm. Uh, at the same time, uh, in which way he is a neoclassical critic? Okay. And uh, it, he also differs from the classical tradition. So how does he differ from the classical tradition? Yeah, he does. I would request you to elaborate these points uh, with hmm. reference to the definition of the play which he writes in the essay. Okay. Okay. Let us take things one by one. Yeah, okay. Uh, first is Dryden being called as the father of English criticism exactly, yeah. by Dr. Johnson. And father in the sense uh, of one who originates certain things, one who propagates in a particular, uh, in a sustained manner. Exactly. We know that before Dryden, there is Philip Sidney. Hmm. In the English tradition. In the English tradition, yeah. there is Philip Sidney. But uh, you see, Philip Sidney's work was published after his death, mm -hmm. edited by his sister Mary Sidney. Mm -hmm. And uh, Philip Sidney probably, although thought of being a critic, but he was a renaissance man in more senses than one. Okay. In that sense then, he, his exclusive work was not criticism. Mm -hmm. And he has left very little okay. of, of material that is that one can be collectively called as Sydney's criticism. Okay. Compared to that, uh, Dryden has quite more. Mm -hmm. And father also in the sense, uh, if we take a little simplistically, that after Aristotle, here is a person who is giving us a very well-formed definition of a play. Okay. And uh, besides his off dramatic poesy, he has quite a few other prefaces and other critical writings. Mm -hmm. One or two we would be mentioning in the subsequent chapter, mm -hmm. which gives the position of father of criticism okay. to Dryden. Dryden. Okay. So this is one aspect. Yeah. The second is how he is a neoclassical yeah, critic. Yeah. Uh, a, he is a neoclassical critic because his influences are, say, Aristotle, Longinus, okay. the classical critics. Mm -hmm. So, neoclassical scholars, critics are influenced by the classical minds. Okay. So, in that sense, if you look at his definition, mm -hmm. It is interesting, you will find that uh, the character Lysidius, mm -hmm. he and through, through Lysidius, Dryden, okay. uh, he does not offer, he does not say I am offering a definition. Mm -hmm. He is saying that I am offering a description. Okay. Now, Dryden seems to have anticipated A, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, his definition might be furthered later on okay. and B he is showing, Dryden is showing how he is although taking an influence from Aristotle's definition of tragedy, mm -hmm. how he is how he is giving one of his own. Okay. So subsequently he is actually carrying on the tradition. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the definition then mm -hmm we can find that the definition can be broken up into three parts. Okay, fine. Uh, first part obviously would be a just and lively image of human nature. Okay. <clears throat> that is one. Mm -hmm. Second is representing passions and humors and the changes of fortune to which it is subject. Okay. And the third after the comma for the delight and instruction of mankind. Mm -hmm. Now we need to closely look at it. Starting with, we have asked the question how a, he is a neoclassical critic and then how he differs, differs also. Okay. Now if, we, if you remember, Plato had said that poets 
merely copy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, their works are second-hand imitation. Okay. Now, in Dryden's definition, there is the word image. Okay. Image. Mm -hmm. Dryden doesn't seem to be bothered that this word image is uh, or, or would echo Plato's second-hand mm -hmm. imitation twice removed, twice removed from reality. Uh, he is not really bothered because he thinks that image is okay if it is just. Okay. Another word, important mm. word in Dryden's definition. Just. just. Okay. But you see, just image can also be a very drab kind of an image. Mm -hmm. So onlookers, readers, viewers might not be very interested in it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he... he he inserts the word lively also. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So the, then it becomes a just and lively, lively image, image. Yeah. In, in that sense. And then it is, it is like if, if we, so that is how we, he moves away from Plato. He is not bothered by this image thing being second hand imitation. Okay. And if we again remember Aristotle, Aristotle's definition of tragedy ended with a therapeutic word catharsis. Whereas uh, Dryden seems to be saying, seems to be ending his definition with delight and instruction of mankind. Mm -hmm. Putting equal emphasis on delight and instruction. Mm -hmm. So that is how again he deviates, he moves yes. further uh, away from Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at the, so we, we discussed the first half of Dryden's definition and the third half of Dryden's definition. In the middle, representing its passions and humors and the changes of fortune to which it is subject. Okay. Now, if we remember that from Plato up to Sydney, mm -hmm. there is a touch of the ideal in the representation. Mm -hmm. The ideal. Whereas the definition that Dryden offers seem to be coming closer to that one of the jobs that the poet does is to represent life as it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, we can see that representing its passions and humors. Mm -hmm. And these passions and humors are not static. They keep on changing mm -hmm. and then track the change also as they occur. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense then, he, there seems to be quite a, quite a significant touch of, the, the, of realism in Dryden, which makes him slightly different okay. from the neoclassical okay. critics. Fine. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.